Ramadan, oh Ramadan, month of mercy you are. Welcome Ramadan. Kalabat qablahum qawm Nuhim, fakallahu abdana wa qalu majnu. فدعا ربه أني مغلوب فانتصر ففتحنا وَلَقَدْ تَرَكْنَاهَا آيَةً فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرٍ فَكَيْفَ كَانَ عَذَابِي وَنُذُرٍ وَلَقَدْ يَسْ سرنا القرآن للذكر فهل من مدكر كذبت عاد فكيف كان فكيف كان عذابي ونذر ولقد يسرنا القرآن للذكر فهل من مدكر كذبت ثمود بالنذر فقالوا أبشرا منا واحدا نتبعه إنا إذا لفي ضلال وسعود Oh, 
لَكُمْ بَرَاءَةٌ فِي الزُّبُرِ أَمْ يَقُولُونَ نَحْنُ جَمِيعٌ مُنْتَصِرٌ يوم يسحبون في النار على وجوههم ذوقوا مس سقر إنه الفراغ وكأن الأيام والشهور والسنوات لم يعد لها قيمة أشعر وكأن كل شيء قد انتهى وأنني مقبل على حياة جديدة كم هو غريب هذا الشعور إنني اليوم مكره على ترك وطني وحيدا دون أب أو أم حتى أخي الصغير لم يعد هنا حين كنت في حلب كنت أذهب لزيارة قبورهم علي أخفف وطأة الحزن أما الآن فأنا عاجز حتى عن فعل ذلك لكنهم باقون معي دائما بدعائي وصلاتي Uh, one of the amazing things about uh, the nighttime is that the nighttime is very special whether you're a believer or not. One of the things that psychologists often discuss is that um, nights are usually uh, considered a spiritual time. So they talk about how usually people are more willing to share uh, and they're usually more in touch with their feelings and their emotions at night. And this is why you see uh, when people go out on dates and stuff like that, when, are, when do they usually go out? During the day or at night? Um, so people are more likely to be in touch with their spiritual side uh, and their feelings and their emotions and what Islam does is that it takes advantage of this time 
So while other people are busy doing every, every other things, uh, a believer takes that spiritual time and they take that emotional time and they devote it to their Lord. And one of the things that the scholars often talk about is that the night is a testimony of a person's love. So whatever a person loves, you'll see that they'll usually devote their night to that. So if a person's only concern in life is to have fun and party and maximize pleasure, they'll spend their night trying to do that. If a person's concern is their afterlife and their love for Allah, then they'll spend their night in concern about their akhirah. And they'll spend their night devoted to Allah Azza wa Jal. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, That those who believe, they're stronger in their love for uh, Allah Azza wa Jal. It's no secret, it's no surprise that uh, our ummah today, our nation today, is not doing too well. And I hate to be negative, I hate to be you know, negative about issues, but this is just a reality. And the point isn't for us to become depressed and say we're a goner and there's nothing we can do. The point is how do we bring ourselves out of the situation and how do we become like the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And this is why one of the things that is often said by the classical scholars and even scholars of our time is that if we want to rectify this ummah, if we, want to ch if we really, really care about this ummah, we really want to change this ummah, then we will not be able to do it except that which changed the beginning of this ummah. Meaning if we really care, we really, we really want the ummah to progress. Now we're Muslims living in the West and we care about Muslims in America. And we really want Muslims to be in a better state. Then we have to look at the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and how the companions did it. And it is in that that we're going to find uh, our, our ummah come to life. And the thing about the companions, like I mentioned, is that what they had and what is missing from, from our time is that, that attribute of going above and beyond uh, the bare minimum. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas he says about the companions, he said, I did not see a single companion. He said, I did not see a single companion except that they would take something from the night. Meaning they would pray some type of Qiyam al-Layl. And one of the questions, one of the most off questions I get from young people is, you know what, my Iman is just not doing too well. Like I have a dip in my Iman and I just don't feel it anymore. Or a lot of times people who start practicing Islam, they'll have this Iman high and they're doing really, really well. And then a time will come where, where they'll be like, you know, it just doesn't feel the same anymore. Or a lot of times reverts and converts will say, when I first became Muslim, it was the most amazing experience of my life. And I want that back. I want that experience back. And one of the first questions I ask these people is, how is your connection with Allah? How is your Qiyam al-Layl? When was the last time you got up in the middle of the night or in the last third of the night to pray to your Lord? And if the answer, answer usually is, well, I don't, I don't really do that. I mean, I just try to do my five daily prayers. I'm just happy if I can get that in. And I tell them, I say, listen, if you're cutting off your connection with Allah, how are you going to get better? You can't expect your iman to just get fixed all of a sudden on its own. It's not going to happen. You have to take steps for you to become a better Muslim. You have to take steps to reach that level of iman. When it comes to Qiyam al-Layl, one of the advices I often give, and I give this advice because this was the advice given to me by my teachers, is if you want to pray Qiyam al-Layl, all you have to do is just try it. And I'm not talking about spending a third of the night praying or half of the night praying. I'm saying get up 10 minutes before Fajr. Just 10 minutes before Fajr. And we know the Prophet told us that it is the last third of the night where Allah comes down to the lowest parts of the heaven and He asks, he says, which one of my servants is seeking my forgiveness that I may forgive them? And which one of my servants is seeking my mercy that I may be merciful, merciful for them? Which one of my servants is asking of me that I may give to them? And that, that third of the night is still there in the last 10 minutes before Fajr. So all I'm saying is wake up 10 minutes before Fajr. Not an hour, not two hours before Fajr. 10 minutes before Fajr. And try and, and, and pray Qiyam al-Layl. And experience this amazing spiritual nature that Allah Azza wa has given us, this blessing that Allah Azza wa has given us. And when you get up in the night, number one, you'll see your heart transform. 
You'll feel your heart unlike you've ever felt it before. And I know a lot of us, and this is a problem which is very, very common, where we look at Islam and all we see is a bunch of things we have to do. And, and we're missing that spiritual side of Islam. We're missing that connection with Allah and our Creator. And I tell you that if you're seeking that connection, then get up and pray Qiyamul Layl. You will see your heart transform. You'll see this tranquility and peace that Islam is supposed to be. You know, people talk about Islam. Islam means peace and all that kind of stuff. If you will really want to experience that, get up in that last third of the night. Get up for 10 minutes and you will see that peace and tranquility descend upon you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am back at the Good Social Cafe having tea this time with Anella. Yes. Um, I don't know your surname either. Actually, I do. What was it? It's Mustafich. Mustafich. Yes. Uh, mashallah, beautiful Bosnian surname. Um, so, we're going to be talking again about um, uh, Anella's reversion to Islam, I suppose. Um, I don't know if you prefer being called a convert or a revert. I don't mind either. You don't mind either? But same. Um, yeah, so we're going to start a little with the kind of getting to know Tanella a little bit and I'm just going to ask you to share about yourself, whatever you want, whatever okay. you want the public to know. Um, so I am 26 years old. Um, I am born and raised in Adelaide. Mm -hmm. um, I have one child <laughs> um, and she keeps me very busy. Um, I completed a law degree but I'm currently on maternity leave mm -hmm. and yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. I love all of that. And your child is absolutely beautiful, mashallah. Thank you. Um, so the topic today obviously is um, how you converted to Islam and your experience around that. But I just wanted to kind of ask you, how long have you been Muslim? Um, um, since 2016, so about four years now. Oh, four years. I think to this month, actually. That, actually, that, that might seem like a long time to a lot of people, but actually that's... Too short to not, me. Yeah, yeah that must have gone really quickly. And yeah. you were, so you're 26 now, four years ago, 22. Still super yeah. young. Yeah. Um, now, I'm going to ask a question I always ask. And it's a cliche question, but it's, I think, one of those questions that everybody wants to know about. And it's, um, what drew you to Islam? Okay, um, so basically I had a lot of friends around me and a lot of people that I knew that were Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, so Islam wasn't necessarily new to me. Mm -hmm. um, I had been shown through their character and their actions what Islam was, yeah. um, but I hadn't really questioned it much further. Um, and then I guess I really wanted to learn more. So I'd bought a few books about Islam just mm -hmm. because I like to read and know things about history and people. Mm -hmm. um, I also did an international studies degree at university. So um, it basically went from there. And then one of the books that I read, um, it was a very basic book, mm. but it was written by a revert. Mm. And that what was book, the book if I think? Uh, it was Islam, It's Basic pra Practices and Beliefs by mm -hmm. Abdul Haq Buley. I think I've seen this book around, but I've yeah. never read it. Um, it's very basic, um, but it was written in such a way that I could actually understand properly. Mm -hmm. um, a few books that I'd read previously, they were a bit too convoluted in the way that they were written. And mm. I think they were more aimed at people who had more of an understanding than I did at the time. Yeah. Um, so for me, even though I grew up in an Italian-Australian household and mm -hmm. my family were Catholic mm -hmm. um, and I went to a Catholic school, I believed in God, um, but it didn't really go much further than that. We mm. celebrated Easter, Christmas, um, and then when I read this book, it just explained creation and God um, so basically. And from there, I wanted to learn how to pray. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الصلاة خير من النوم الصلاة خير من النوم الله أكبر الله أكبر اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة والصلاة القائمة آت محمدا الوسيلة والفضيلة وابعثه مقاما محمودا الذي وعدته إنك لا تخلف الميعاد. Um, so I actually learned how to pray before I converted to Islam. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's really random. You know, I actually heard of a woman who put on the hijab before she became a Muslim, and I was like, it's really why? Interesting. Yeah. She said. Well, I, at the time, I, was, I considered myself a feminist and it was a feminist statement because I wanted to take my body away from society. And that's just, actually a very good point. Th that blew my mind. Yeah. But that's interesting that I'm you sure actually learned really how to pray as well. Yeah, so for me, it was about that connection, like re-establishing that connection with God and going from there. And then I wanted to learn how to pray the Islamic way mm -hmm. um, because the way that um, prayer and everything that was described in the book, mm -hmm. it just made so much more sense to me. Um, and so I started with a few prayers here and there. Mm -hmm. And then gradually I just started to feel bad about missing prayers. Um, and then I wanted to wake up for Fajr and I wanted to pray all the prayers. And I felt like if I wasn't like, you know, God has created such a beautiful earth and so much creation mm -hmm. um, for us to like live in and like we owe it to him to be dutiful to him basically. Mm. Um, so I wanted to pray. And then, yeah, I think a few days after that, it was about maybe a month process. I mm -hmm. mean, I'd known about Islam for a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of me converting, it was about a month. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, I just wanted to become Muslim. I didn't really delve into much other than that. I just knew that I felt a really strong connection with God and I wanted to go from there. I wanted mm -hmm. to pray. Um, hijab was a thing that came much, much, not much, much later, but it wasn't something 
that I considered at the time. Yeah. Um, it was just more about being dutiful to God um, and praying and praying on time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was basically how it started. You know, it's so interesting that every um, rebirth story is different. Mm. And it's, you know, some people might know so little about Islam and take on Islam. And for some people, yeah. it requires a lot more. And they, you know, their journey, every single journey is so different. And, you know, uh, the last person I spoke to has, uh, again, a different story to yours. So it's, it's just fascinating to me the way that God, Allah kind of guides people individually and Definitely. gives them what they need specific to their situation every single time. Um, I want to come back to your story and uh, did your family have a strong reaction when you first accepted Islam? When I first became Muslim it wasn't so bad. I mm. don't think they really understood the extent of it. Um, <laughs> I wasn't embarrassed but I didn't want to make them feel uncomfortable. So mm. I, I mean the first month I took to myself, it mm -hmm. was just before Ramadan and I made sure I took that month um, to learn more about Islam so that when I spoke to them about it, mm -hmm. if they had questions, um, I could answer them properly. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really a really special time for me because it was um, about me and my connection with God and I could elaborate more on that without having outside pressure from anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, when I spoke to them about it, um, I guess they kind of just shrugged it off a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't praying at the home. I was not living at home at the time. Um, so it wasn't so much in their face. Mm -hmm. um, I fasted that month and they didn't really understand it, but they didn't ask questions. <laughs> um, I mean, they made comments, but they never really, you know, went mm -hmm. much further than that. And then the biggest struggle was when I decided to wear a headscarf. That was when things got a bit iffy. That seems to be a trigger, doesn't it? Yeah, it really is. It really because is. Because the Islam becomes obvious. Yes. Mm. Yes. Um, so that was when the issues started. I mean, coming from an Italian Australian family, mm. my family eats pork heavily. They drink alcohol. I mean, alcohol is basically in all the dishes, in desserts, in pasta, in sauce, in everything. Mm. So even that was hard because telling them that I can't eat something or, you know, I might have to bring my own food is, you know, you don't really do that. Subhanallah. And so, how is your relationship now with your parents and with your family? Alhamdulillah, it's fine now. Um, you still run into the occasional road bump I guess in mm. terms of food or mm. alcohol or um, if they buy something say it's a cake and you just say hang on like what's in it is it like something mm. I can't eat is there pork derived gelatin or is there alcohol in it and they go mm. hang on yeah there actually probably might be <laughs> got to think about that um, so I think it's hard for them because sometimes people when they live their life they just do things they just live it whereas they us like we try we kind of think about conscious. things yeah That's we're a lot more things. conscious about what we consume mm. um, and I think from that it can cause some issues um, but I'm glad they've been really good now uh, mm. it was initially like I said when I put the headscarf on that they reacted mm. um, but yeah been quite good now mm. and, ha and how is your experience kind of um, with the headscarf now and your, your kind of comfort level with the headscarf in yeah. the Muslim and non-Muslim community um, it's good I think uh, something that really helped me was when I decided to put it on, I was working in customer service, so mm. I was like the forefront of socialization with people. <laughs> um, and I think that was also really daunting for me because mm. I knew that I'd worked for that company for about six years yeah. and one day I was going to go there without a scarf and the next day I decided I was going to go with it on. Yeah. Um, and it kind of took a few weeks for people to really understand that. They mm -hmm. had no idea. A lot of people didn't even know I was Muslim, um, which you wouldn't unless you actually asked me or spoke to me about mm. it. Um, so yeah, it was hard, but I think that really built up my strength because I had to go from something where people didn't really ask me personal questions to more personal questions like why are you wearing that? Mm -hmm. I thought you come from an Italian household. I See, thought you were uh, Catholic. We didn't know you were yeah. Muslim. Like, you know, those kind of comments or did you get married? Stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So did your husband force you? Was exactly. Basically, it was so always trying to find out the real reason for why you're doing yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to the general public, it looks confusing because one day you're not wearing one, next day you are. So mm. I totally understood it. And I think you just have to be really confident in yourself and really confident in your beliefs. I mean, for me, I knew my intention of why I was putting it on. Um, That's so, so important. So, so important. important. So people making negative comments, it would upset me on the surface, but it didn't bother me. Like when I became Muslim and when I put a headscarf on, I'd never felt more myself than That's I had beautiful. beforehand. So. 
I just took it and just, you know, people are going to say what they're going to say. You're going to like me or not like me. Whether or not I wear a headscarf or not, it doesn't really matter. I don't live to serve you, you know what I mean? So, alhamdulillah, I feel really confident in it now. Um, I had a lot of criticism from some family members about, will you get a job if you're wearing one? Mm, Like, you've been in this job for your whole life. When you go to get a real job, will you actually get a job doing what you want to do because I was studying a law degree Mm -hmm. Um, and humbler I got a good job um, somewhere where I knew nobody so I had to prove myself there and yeah I guess that just solidified for me when you do something for God um, it will get returned somehow. Absolutely and I love that you touched on the point of kind of having a really firm intention. Mm. Um, You know starting a task with no intention it's um, it, it that, that, that doesn't not does not give you strength and certainty in what you're doing I agree. um having an intention one way or the other is so important to kind of completing anything um, in the right way but i mean our intention it can change over time it can dwindle over time so i think it's one of those things that you actually have to constantly revisit yeah definitely. um and i think with the hijab because it's such an obvious thing and it's something that we get judged on so much it's actually so important to revisit one's intention and even if you know why you're wearing it definitely revisit why you are wearing it as a muslim woman because that will strengthen you in the wrong in the long run and i would say that it's even normal to struggle with the hijab sometimes oh, it does not mean you should remove it I agree. it means that you should renew your intention and look again as to why Allah has ordained the hijab for you and for the Muslim woman because believe me the wisdom in that is infinite and I spoke about it a bit in the last interview so I won't kind of go into that again um, but yeah thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on the hijab and I think there yes. your experience is absolutely beautiful thank you um, I wanted to ask you about leaving some advice for advice. the it can be for the non-muslims or for the muslim community or people who are looking to accept islam or thinking about islam or or even for the uh, just the female viewers um, yeah whatever kind of you want to leave with it's really broad but <laughs> um, whatever i you think like. it's really important um touching on intention and being confident in yourself knowing why you're doing something Mm -hmm. being conscious of the reasons that you do things Mm -hmm. um questioning things that may not necessarily seem um different Mm -hmm. i know that when i wasn't muslim things that like wearing short shorts or wearing a singlet wasn't unknown to me it was normal Mm -hmm. and then when i became muslim the more i started to question whether or not that was actually a good thing um it just came naturally you know like People always think that by wearing a headscarf, your power is taken away, but it's the actual opposite. Like you feel so much more empowered controlling what people can see about you and know about you. Um, So for me, I think it's always really important, um, no matter who you are, Muslim, non-Muslim, to question things Mm -hmm. and look for the answer Mm -hmm. and work really hard towards that. It's, that's so beautiful what you just said. It's almost like you're saying, Become conscious. Live your yeah, life definitely. consciously. Do not do things just because that's how you've always done them. Yeah, I think that's just fantastic. Thank you, Thank you so much, Tanella. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. No worries. Um, we can talk all day, but, yeah. but we can't. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't. That's okay. <laughs> we cannot. Uh, yeah, Jazakallah Thank you for having thank me. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, a warm salam alaikum to our viewers. And uh, it's been a pleasure. minutes boys your job is to collect all the letters the letters can be hidden trees fences under poles
What did you learn, I, Ziad? I learned how to make tents and survive snake bites. I learned how to cook, which is good. I learned how to filter water. I learned how to use a convertible stove. I, I know how to make a tent. I learned how to cook chicken and rice. And how to purify dirty water. I've improved my organization skills. I learned how to uh, survive in the wild. Okay. I learned navigation in the wild and I learned CPR. Okay, Omar. I learned how to do it first aid. Ramadan is a month of mercy. Every year many people around the world struggle to find food to break their fast. Let's together this Ramadan give them joy and happiness. Month of mercy you are. Welcome Ramadan.